Yeah. Yeah. Four fingers of bourbon. And I wish I could put four fingers of bourbon. Yeah. <coughs> How is the oil now? Oh, 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 I think you are so good. Very good. Well, why, why don't you sit next to your old friend? Defer to your... Can we start? Okay, uh, we have... Uh, I feel uh, just unbelievably honored to be surrounded by uh, these uh, people who I have uh, loved for I don't know how long. And I suppose the thing to do is introduce themselves in their own beautiful voices. I start starting over there with Mr. Brennan and going on. Joseph Payne Brennan. <laughs> Bob Block. <laughs> uh, Frank uh, B. Long. Gail Wilson, and he wonders what he's doing here. Uh, I've, I've, I've been given the job of moderator with no warning at all, uh, so uh, winging it uh, in the same order, I suppose a little introductory remark uh, would, would be a good thing. Just whatever you want to say for, you know. Well, uh, <laughs> honestly, I haven't thought of anything really intelligent to say on the theme of the panel. Uh, Certainly nothing original. I I've forgotten the exact wording of it, but it seems, I believe it's, the gist of it is uh, why do you write supernatural fiction, or, or why do you think you write it, or something of that sort. And uh, I haven't come up with anything specific and concrete. Uh, I just have the feeling that you can't pin it down to one concrete factor. I think it's a uh, there are a number of factors involved, such as your childhood, your upbringing, heredity, and probably pure happenstance. Um, I think, in my own case, probably a strong element in it was my own childhood, which was uh, included the so-called Great Depression, and as a result was quite circumscribed and uh, frankly rather dull. My favorite uh, resort was the public library because it didn't cost anything. And I, I think as a result of this I got somewhat introspective and uh, I th indirectly probably this contributed to my daydreaming and later my writing. Uh, what other factors entered in, I'm not sure. Uh, possibly my Irish heritage. The Irish are supposed to have a, an affinity for the supernatural. I think there's some, an element of truth in that. Not only the Irish, but all Celtic peoples. And, uh, well, beyond that, I think it's, there's a strong element of just practicality involved. You, you try different types of writing, and if you have a measure of success in one field, you tend to stay in that field. Uh, I, my first commercial writing of any consequence was actually uh, Western stories, but the old-time Western pulp market disappeared, and uh, I was literally forced into another field, which turned out to be fantasy, <coughs> excuse me, and supernatural horror. I had a, a small measure of success in this, and so I stayed with it, among other things. <coughs> Beyond that, I, I just don't know. I, I, I think it's a combination of these factors working together. Possibly there are others that uh, I'm unaware of myself. But I think I'm picking up too much time. Bob? When I was a boy, back in Arkham, 
I, too, lived through the Great Depression. As far as I'm concerned, it wasn't all that great. <laughs> when I got out of high school, by expulsion, I uh, was faced with a terrible choice that everybody had in the Depression. It was a dilemma. to either work or starve. I decided to combine the two by becoming a writer. <laughs> a matter of fairly common knowledge that uh, H.P. Lovecraft is the one who was responsible for steering me in that direction. He turned me on and turned me loose. <coughs> I had a natural affinity for this sort of thing because as a kid I had the usual childhood fears of several things. One, death. Two, life. <laughs> I was afraid of uh, my, my fellow children. I was afraid of adults. I was a little bit suspicious about what happened to you if you did too much breathing. So, uh, and I knew, of course, that they were all against me. <laughs> so I merely encapsulated this information and began to distribute it to other people in the form of fiction. My own paranoid fantasies were projected and exorcised, if you will. I found that I could exorcise these fears by giving vent to them in story form, and I found also that apparently some readers got a degree of exorcism. Occasionally, uh, I found I could learn to introduce a few laughs, give them a little entertainment along the way. Also uh, served as a salutary breather for me. But I'd always been enchanted by fantasy from, because all of us at that time, and I think today still, though, from other media, are brought up on fairy tales. Today it's called advertising commercials. But, it's, <laughs> but in those days, we, uh, we got it directly from the book, or uh, your parents, your grandparents told you stories. The great deal of play acting in those days. You uh, dressed up. I remember as a child, uh, we had backyard circuses, and uh, turn, I turned the uh, front porch into a pirate ship using uh, one of these piano stools for a uh, steering wheel and a plank from the dining room table to make the younger kids walk. And it ruined the flower beds, to say nothing of a few of their heads, but uh, this was the sort of thing you did. You improvised. You made your world as a child knows these is entirely make-believe. Even the toys you got were artifacts which assisted you in make-believe. And uh, there weren't such uh, scientific gadgets as are presently available. You could buy a, a, what they called a chemcraft set, but it wasn't all that much fun to make stink bombs. <laughs> and so I was, I tended towards uh, make-believe of drama in high school, I got into amateur theatricals, and so it was an easy step to make the transition to the printed page, where I would impersonate all of these evil characters. But in back of it was this great question, which is embodied in the topic of this panel: Why? Why are we born? Why do we? Live? Why do we die? Why do forces seem to conspire against us? And I think all of us, whatever our degree of sophistication, have occasion in our lives when we sit back and, and we say to ourselves, very privately, very secretly, because as sophisticated individuals, we're not supposed to, why? Why is it going to happen? Why have I done this or that? Or why am I a certain age and can only look forward to so many more years? Is this all there is to it? Will it all end? All of these things plague us. And I think, again, we can exorcise this. We also discussed in an earlier panel today some of the uh, attributions that are made. I believe that uh, a lot of us find uh, convenient refuge in the devil theory, that uh, someone else is responsible for all ills and evils. And uh, fantasy is a perfect embodiment of this, but it's an embodiment in which the devils are kept under the control of the writer and consequently of the reader. We can evoke them, we can also dispose of them. It's one of the few areas left in which good can still triumph over evil. 
and uh, that's one of the reasons I'm afraid it's called fantasy. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Robert just told me I can speak into uh, both microphones, which might be just as well, since uh, uh, oh. I arrived very late today, uh, today, and my voice has probably lost all of its resonance. But anyhow, uh, uh, Bob Block has very has a. Uh, it's a very important thing, I think, about how we can't always be exactly certain just when our interest in the uh, in weird writing of weird fiction or supernatural horror uh, first arose. I know looking back across the years, I find it rather difficult to tell exactly at what point I became spe uh, steered in that direction. But I know that from an early age, I was I, I, my reading was all, always in the field of fantasy. I mean, I liked the Oz books like most kids when I was quite young, and the Brothers Grimm, the great German fairy story writers. I think that uh, the Brothers Grimm really didn't write for children at all. They were very sophisticated horror story writers. But uh, unlike H.P. Lovecraft, who read no uh, juvenile fiction at all, I did read a few things up to about the age of 10 or 12, uh, as I say, uh, particularly the Oz books. But then after that, I read very few boys' books or anything of that sort. But uh, outside of this, fanciful, uh, this uh, trend towards fantasy in my early uh, youth, I mean, my early childhood, rather, uh, I can't put any particular, I can't say with any particular, uh, uh, place any particular stress on the exact time when all of this began. But I, I feel that I was probably disdained from an early age to be more interested in the imaginative aspects of reality than in the uh, down to earth aspects. But uh, there's no doubt that Lovecraft exerted a profound influence on me when I was. Uh, <coughs> Uh, 18 to 20 and so forth. I began to correspond with him uh, when I was about 18, and uh, his letters and everything uh, uh, undoubtedly strengthened whatever interest I might have in the supernatural. But uh, Poe always fascinated me, Poe and some of the early American story writers, Beers and so forth, and I, I unquestionably had a great bias in that direction. But I read all kinds of books, as so many youngsters uh, do, and I, I particularly liked adventure stories and sea stories. And I think adventure in, uh, uh, in all corners of the world fascinated me about as much as the supernatural or pure fantasy until my early 20s. Uh, well, uh, as I say, uh, there are so many, uh, so many uh, influences which converge in that respect. It's very hard to put a definite period uh, at the time when you became more interested in the supernatural horror story and fantasy than any other kind of writing. And later, of course, the science fiction. I, I switched to science fiction uh, in regard to perhaps three quarters of my output uh, from about the, uh, well, about from, eight, from 19... 28 uh, on, you see. But I continue to write fantasy. I've always been very partial to that field. And I wrote one recently that I think is one of my better things, as good as anything I ever wrote in the old weird tale days. And I would like to write a great deal more of it, but there is not the market for it that there is for science fiction, unfortunately. I think there will be. I'm hoping that uh, uh, more and more people will begin to realize what an important aspect uh, of, of, of uh, uh, how important science fiction is. Well, uh, there will probably be, uh, 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 like, uh, like Bob, I arrived too late uh, to be uh, sure of precise weighting of this, uh, this, this, this panel, uh, but I think it was about supernatural horror story writing in general, you see. And I think we'll all have a great deal more to say about that as we, as we go on. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, I think uh, S.J. Perelman uh, said, <clears throat> somebody asked him what was the prime requisite uh, for a humorist, and he said, an unhappy childhood. <laughs> and I think the same probably goes uh, for the, the fantasy person. Um, 
I think you've got to be one of those creepy kids that uh, sort of lurks in alleys and uh, you know, is usually, uh, when they choose up the baseball teams, uh, who's the last one chosen? And uh, Might I interject something that happened to me that was far worse? When they would choose up sides for a baseball team, they used me for the ball. <laughs> well, I, I should have been so honored. Uh, I was, I was, to put the, when, once, once the, the team had got me, they'd uh, put me out, <clears throat> we played on these vacant lots, and uh, there was, uh, there was field, I figured, I, I mean, I, the whole thing's been repressed, so I'm maybe a little shaking the details, but it was either left field or, or right field, the extreme one that nobody tended to hit there, you know, <laughs> so I would be put there, and they'd say, go further out, Wilson, go further out, you know, so I would stand there, uh, waiting for the street lights to go on, which meant that the uh, game was something to go home and I could listen to the radio and relax and be done with this horrible business. Um, so that, that's, that's absolutely essential. Um, then uh, with this, 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 this uh, strip I'm doing for the Lampoon, the, the nuts thing, the, the basic premise, thank you, the basic premise of it is that uh, being a little kid, even if you're a well-adjusted little kid, which the kid in this strip is much better adjusted than, than I was, um, he, uh, you can't understand anything that's going on. It's all mysterious. Uh, it's all confusing and terrifying. Uh, you're supposed to uh, learn these unbelievably complicated rules and regulations. Uh, things are switched on you. Uh, and you're just, everybody's bigger than you are. That's one thing right there. There's a little tiny lump. And they can push you around. And they can outguess you. And uh, you're, you're, just, you're just a loser. Uh, so, well, what I did faced with this <clears throat> intolerable reality was to escape into my imagination and I've never come out. Um, I think, uh, oh yes, another essential is to join the Cub Scouts. That's good. <laughs> Very helpful with the fantasy thing. Um, and then I, I think, um, as uh, Mr. Block said, the, the element of magic comes in uh, very heavily. You, uh, you become a magician. You can take these things and you can sort of uh, incarnate them and then you can push them around you know and uh, it's a very satisfactory uh, thing when you when you make your first ghost and then uh, and destroy it it's, uh, I can't tell you how, how happy I was when I, when I pulled that one off that's, that's enough of me okay. you know I didn't ask to be on this panel or to ask, answer the question which is bothered my friends here at the why. Once I knew a man who was going to write a story, fantasy or science fiction or both, anyway, invaders from somewhere else coming and driving the human race crazy with a single question. Why? But uh, since it's here, I suppose it's to be answered. Why? Uh, whoever it was that climbed Mount Everest. Why? They said. He said because it was there. Well, because it's there is not enough. I think uh, if anything there, it's a possible reader. Why? Well, because you must. <coughs> Deep within the human souls, I think, there is an impulse to wonder and to create. There's a man named Marshak who writes about prehistoric man. Do you know him? Do you know who he is? He writes beautifully. He studied for long years, bathed himself in it. The question of prehistoric art not simply the beautiful, wonderful, strange painting in the case that Crow Marion Mann and his fellows did. But far before that, the effort to make a flint point or a tool, not simply utilitarian, but sideling. He thought and wrote that he thought this impulse of the artistic goes back perhaps 150,000 years in 
man's prehistory. Back to before, if you please, where there were men. The thing about this, I it struck me when I read it that uh, another art form is that of the story, imaginative story. Perhaps it is a universal thing in man, sort of like the impulse to religion, almost amounting to an instinct. Well, over the centuries, the millennia, civilization seeks to flog this out of it. You've been all talking about your childhood. Do you not remember that until the adults got to you, your minds were sharp and they ranged far and in them almost anything could be possible. I remember back when we had to write stories in school. If I can go back, I have to go back farther than most of these people. This was way early in the 20th century and they would ask us to write stories and people would write stories about good little boys and how they did better than the bad little boys and I would write peculiar stories <laughs> about winged men fighting dragons up there in the sky and the caves into which you would go and uh, what you would find there and a teacher, a very nice teacher, and boy how she could whop you. <laughs> she kept me in at recess to talk about a story of mine. Where did you get this? And I said, well, I just thought of it. You thought of this? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And she said, if you don't stop thinking about that, you'll go crazy. <laughs> well, I never stopped thinking about it. <laughs> I'm sure that my uh, mental processes, I mean, the psychiatrist would get hold of me while he'd be just like a kid in a candy store, but never let this how I want to live and I've done it. <laughs> I won't go into reminiscence of my youth, except that like all of these others, these things were strong upon me. The thing that, shall we just say the thing that isn't happening but ought to the whole business of imagination I've never gotten away from and maybe that's why all my life I've liked to hang out with the unsophisticated, the simple, the folk people, the honest to God ladies and men, as I do to this day whenever I can get time to leave Chapel Hill, North Carolina where I live and get up into the mountains, hear them talk, hear their music, hear their stories. Come back maybe and write something. And uh, let me tell you, I'm not whipped yet, not by the teacher or by anything else. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep on writing this. And uh, uh, here has been a little bear story out here about how this this fantasy, this wonder, this horror doesn't do quite so well. It's doing immeasurably better than it did a while back. And it's being taken criti uh, critically serious. And I'm glad of that because I always did take a sick time. All right, now I guess we'll just throw it over to questions from the audience. Yes? I think almost everyone on the panel has written uh, both science fiction and fantasy. Uh, do the panelists uh, consider one of uh, the two hottest right to the other? I suppose we'll just go down the line unless anyone wants to. Uh, well, I, I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, personally, I would, I, I think I've done a small portion of science fiction, but I, uh, I have and would find it much more difficult because I lack the, the background to write it as it's written today. I, I don't have the background in, uh, in the sciences which is required in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, physics, astronomy, biology, and uh, seven or eight other fields. So I personally would find it <coughs> far more difficult uh, 
primarily for that one reason. It's not that I have, I'm not interested in it or wouldn't like to write it, but I, I don't feel I'm well equipped to do it with the competition. I'd say there are probably two reasons why I find it easier to write fantasy than to write science fiction. The first is a question of early influences. For example, the work of Gahan Wilson, which I've been familiar with ever since I was a little boy. <laughs> I read my first Manly Wade Wellman story, Back to the Beast, in 1927, I believe. I think that's right. And my first Frank Belfast Long story in the same year. And these people were, were giants in the fantasy field. They, they were a profound influence on me. Mr. Brennan's work came on a, a trifle later, but by that time I was thoroughly hooked and I was more interested in reading the works of other fantasy writers than I was in science fiction writing per se. The other reason is this. I was always something of a rebel and a nonconformist, and I resented the fact that in science, the stories at one time at least had to be based on solid scientific laws principles and postulates which could not be violated. I wanted to be free to uh, mold an imaginary world in any shape, manner, or form that I conceived of it. There was a much greater degree of latitude in fantasy. In other words, another way of putting it, I could be much sloppier <laughs> and consequently enjoyed myself more. And I think uh, to the undisciplined mind, uh, fantasy will always have a, a stronger emotional appeal. Well, uh, uh, I think that uh, much, much for what, uh, what passes for science fiction today is for this fantasy, of course. You see, there, there are these technological science stories that a great many science fiction writers uh, they specialize in, and, and usually they're written by biochemists or engineers or some other technical scientist who is connected with a big laboratory and that sort of thing. But uh, I think some of the best science fiction, I think it definitely comes in the category of science fiction, uh, of wages on fantasy, and you don't have to do a great deal of research to write stories of that nature. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I'd be ashamed to tell you how little research I have done on uh, several of my science fiction stories that uh, are, are considered based on sound science and so forth. You simply have a striking idea, and you go to the library, and you read up on it. I have no knowledge at all, I mean no extensive <coughs> knowledge at all of physics, astronomy, chemistry, or any of the uh, biochemistry, or any of the modern scientific fields at all. My, I, I'm, I'm predominantly a fantasy writer, but I think I have done enough research just on the... Uh, just because one particular story demands it uh, to make uh, some of these stories very convincing in that respect. But I couldn't hope to compete with uh, some of the technological scientists writing today. But I think the two fields, and this is, of course, a terrible thing to say at, at, a, at a fantasy convention, the two fields overlap to a very great extent. I'm hoping that perhaps they won't overlap to quite such an extent, that in the future uh, the, uh, it will be realized how important fantasy is. It's it's just as important as science fiction, and that both fields should be accepted as great advances in imaginative fiction. I mean, they, they, they foretell the future. But I don't think you can find yourself... I, I, that of course, there's the term science, the scientific fantasy, too, which I thought at one time I had coined, but it's been used quite often. It means that your, uh, your fantasy is predominantly based on what, you, what the layman would consider... Uh, sound scientific ideas, you see, but actually when you analyze them, they are neither perhaps so sound or so scientific. But as I say, if I had my uh, absolute freedom to, to write just as I please, I would probably write very few uh, science fiction stories in, in, in a strict sense. They would be all scientific fantasy or the uh, supernatural <laughs> horror type of story. And I have a great bent on supernatural horror. I wish the field was more appreciated because I think that... Uh, Bob has done tremendous things in that field. There's no one can compare with him. And it's a field that should be more widely recognized, and I hope it is becoming so all the time. Even though it has been for 25 years or more, 
considered one of the most important uh, aspects of, of, of imaginative fiction, uh, I think really the future can be even more commended. Um, so this panel is uh, one short, uh, Mr. Carter isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> We'll appreciate that, uh, I'm sure you uh, know Mr. Block, obviously, if not to. And Mr. Wolheim, you've got to know him. Who are you? I am uh, Mysterious Gay and Wilson. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I am stuck with being the chairman of this thing by uh, Mr. McCauley. <coughs> so, uh, it's about the future of the fantasy and horror thing, and uh, I have trouble saying horror because I come from the Midwest, so it tends to come out horror. <laughs> so, excuse me. Um, and he, uh, he said uh, to, uh, it would be to sort of lean on the financial uh, end of it, the business end of it, uh, a bit, uh, instead of just being aesthetic, and I think he's, he's got an excellent point. The, uh, the figure that sort of looms over this whole operation is, of course, uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, and uh, the bleak reality of Mr. Lovecraft's life was poverty. Um, and uh, I think it's a uh, unfortunate uh, truth that this, this area, the fantasy area, and the common fiction and whatnot, is plagued uh, generally by uh, very, very low money. Uh, you don't get too much money for it. So uh, part of the, uh, the motivation for this get-together is uh, not just to venerate and congratulate those people we really, really love and have done such marvelous stuff, but also to uh, take a, a, a cue from the, the Mystery Writers of America and the science fiction writers who got together and uh, they award each other prizes and so on, and then you can put on your book uh, one so-and-so prize. And then this guy says, hey, well, maybe I'll buy it, you know, and he does. <laughs> so uh, that's, 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 that's the thing. I, 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 I think Kirby's absolutely correct, and I think that, uh, we should go into that, the money thing, the, encouraging the, uh, the publishers to uh, publish the, uh, the fantastic stuff and, you know, expand into the, into the horrific thing. And uh, there's a, a tendency to say, well, you know, they don't sell, but, uh, you know, there's Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist and a couple little things like that, which have done rather well. And uh, Frankenstein and Dracula continue to be uh, active. <coughs> and uh, so, you know, there's something to be said for it as a, as a commercial viable uh, field. So I'll, I'll just go alphabetically now for Mr. Blood. When I got into writing, it was in uh, prehistoric times, <laughs> and uh, we didn't even, we didn't even have typewriters. <laughs> we didn't come out of the cave, we'd get a block of stone, <laughs> and we would uh, hack something out on the stone, the editor would take it away and chisel it in the final form. <laughs> well, millenniums have passed since then, and most writers are still hacks, and most editors are still chiselers. <laughs> serious for a moment. <laughs> I would like to say when I got into writing in 1934, the pulp days, so-called because most writers were beaten to a pulp by the publishers, uh, the standard going rate was about a penny a word. But at that time, of course, there was no television. Motion pictures did very little fantasy. Uh, there were no paperbacks. And foreign markets were practically non-existent. Now, of course, today we do have the paperbacks, we do have the uh, foreign markets, there are television sales and film sales to be made, and less than 95% of the writers are making a penny of work, because there aren't that many markets from the pulse that remain. Actually, the situation hasn't changed all that much. If one were to consider the viable markets for fantasy, 
one would realize that the once 25 cent paper back is now selling for a dollar and a quarter, dollar and a half, a dollar seventy five, in some cases two dollars and two and a quarter. And I don't believe that the uh, rates paid to the majority of writers have increased in that proportion or that percentage. So there's still an economic problem, and it's a severe one, it's a serious one. Actually, that economic problem, I think, is, has more to do with the lack of markets than anything else. I uh, had the dubious pleasure this morning of being routed out of bed by a gentleman named Robert L. Fish, the eminent author of the Schlock Home Stories, the De Silva Brazilian Mysteries, and the Keck Huygens Stories, who is sitting right here in the audience in about the fifth row and uh, deserves your attention and commendation. That, uh, rather degenerate looking gentleman in the blue with the curly forelock. <laughs> I really wanted to point him out, you don't have to approve him. <laughs> but one of the things that we were discussing was the peculiar fate of short stories. The fact that today, with so few regular markets open to a given genre, we send out our material, we're not quite sure just where it's going to land. We'll write something specifically with one market in mind, and for some reason or other it's rejected, and it'll end up in an entirely different place. And if one were to consider a career as a fantasy writer today, I think one would be hard put to say, I've got this market, this market, and this market as sure outlets, and I can probably send stories to them in a one, two, three order. I think this, more than anything else, is what constricts the field. It's not just economics, it's a lack of the, uh, of the regular market. When Weird Tales was in existence, we knew where to send stories. And that is no longer true, unfortunately. So what is going to be needed, I think, is uh, a breakthrough, an opening up. It's true that in films and television, fantasies are occasionally uh, employed, but there is as you undoubtedly know this year, a new concept in television between 7 and 9 p.m. or between 7 and 10 p.m., I'm not sure which, called family time. This is a little uh, incestuous arrangement cleaned <laughs> up by the network executives, the same brilliant network executives who selected the shows which they are now canceling a month after the show on the air replaced by other shows which uh, are being selected by the same gentleman. The shows are canceled, the executives are never canceled. <laughs> At any rate, and the rates are pretty damn miserable, I must tell you, uh, the law now is on television, nobody dies before 9 o'clock. <laughs> and this rather puts a crimp in the fantasy market for television. As far as the fantasy market for films is concerned, uh, there is a slight tendency to go in the uh, direction of the explicit, and um, this constricts fantasy too, because uh, all they want is the more lurid horror material, shock rather than horror in many instances. So you can't be assured of a, of a uh, solid market there. Now, there's only one person that could probably solve such a dilemma, and I would imagine that would be a reformed editor. Now, whether you would say it was a reformation since he's turned publisher, I don't really know, but I'd like to see what Don Elheim has to say on this topic. Uh, the question, is this working? No. The question, I care. Try the line. The question of whether uh, horror and fantasy will hold in paperbacks it is something which people are getting into more and more. Uh, there was a time, as Bob Block said, when the pulp magazines were the <coughs> medium by which uh, people broke into print and which sold. That was in the 30s. And in those days, the uh, you might say the fantasy uh, weird magazine, outside of the terra horror type of thing, was restricted to weird tales, which paid very low and very poorly and somewhat slowly. 
I always had the rather the smallest circulation of any pulp magazine, even when the time when science fiction, three science fiction magazines to a man to make ends meet, weird tales barely squeaked through. Of course, you had the terror horror pulps of the 30s, which was a somewhat different proposition, which produced very little worth uh, rereading. Uh, they, they died out uh, as the pulps died out and were replaced by paperbacks, which sort of kept breaking into fields, as I thought they had discovered, which all people knew all about long before. Uh, what has happened, uh, I think in the past few years, the paperbacks have begun to rediscover the horror novel and the fantasy novel. The fantasy novel, of course, uh, as distinct from the pure so-called hardcore science fiction, uh, made its big breakthrough as Tolkien who is certainly not science fiction, and which proved to be a tremendous success and proved that there is an audience there for a darn good fantasy uh, uh, writing. Uh, an effort was made uh, to produce more what they called adult fantasy, and if Lynn Carter were here, he could tell you more about that, which seemed to boom for a while and which apparently has faded out, at least from what I can see. And again, that's something I'm not going to talk about. Uh, in my own case, uh, when I went into launching my own company, uh, I was faced with a rather difficult proposition. That is to say, I had to put out four books a month uh, of science fiction. And I also had to catch up with my distributor and my co-publisher's schedule, which is eight months ahead, which means I had to do like uh, line up for you know, uh, uh, eight times four books in approximately three months, which wasn't easy, and accounts for one or two of the choices which I probably wouldn't have published today. Uh, one of the choices I made out of relative desperation to fill a slot was the year's best horror story, which was a British volume which I picked up for reprinting. And I admit that I looked at the packaging of the original volume, I sort of tried very hard to say this is really science fiction horror, but, you know, for the most part it isn't. Uh, and I uh, waited to see what happened when this book hit the stands. And interestingly enough, as the uh, reports came in, we found that it was doing quite well. It was not only displayed in the science fiction rack, where it possibly was really an imposter, but it was also being displayed in Gothic and occult racks, uh, being throughout the only paperback horror collection which was on the stands at that time. And as if you follow the career of door books, you'll know now that I have established this as a permanent thing. Number horror, best horror stories of the year, number three is out, and we have gone back to press with number one, which proves that there is an audience for the short, weird horror story. Uh, in other payback companies, you'll find a hacked out series of the uh, adventures, new adventures of Dracula. New Adventures of Frankenstein, and a number of other things which are definitely in the horror category, and which I would assume from their continuation are being successful. Uh, I personally don't particularly want to go into that type of straight horror book. But uh, the question of fantasy, as distinct from science fiction, is an interesting problem. Uh, I am of the opinion that the line between fantasy and science fiction is being blurred more and more. And a great number of books have come out which will be very difficult to decide what they really are, whether they are science fiction uh, in a sense, or whether they're really fantasy novels, uh, adventures of uh, uh, another, another world which may or may not exist, the witch world novels of Anne Van Norton may or may not be fantasy. They may be science fiction, perhaps not. Uh, it depends on what you choose to define, and the public is no longer being too critical about this. They're saying this is a great story or a great adventure, and we don't care whether it takes place on an actual planet somewhere else we're supposed to believe it exists, or whether it just takes place on an imaginary world, and we like it. So the line between science fiction and fantasy is being blurred, and much more fantasy is coming into the field simply in the guise of good Marvel adventure novels, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and I think that this is possibly the, the key of the future. Uh, science fiction, which has always sought out uh, you know, rationalizations for the uh, fantastic adventures that they depict, 
uh, has managed to come up with so many rationalizations that practically anything can be rationalized as possible. If you take one <coughs> viewpoint that the universe is infinite, within, in, it, within infinity anything is possible, hence all is science fiction. Uh, the question of parallel worlds is just about accepted. Enough people have come up with pseudo-scientific conjectures to allow anybody to accept anything in a parallel world viewpoint. Even the question of alternate futures, or alternate presents, I should say, that supposing that such and such an event in history had turned out in a different fashion. This used to be a very peculiar proposition, because it was never really science fiction, and it was never really anything but a, a historical a fantasy concept. But uh, even this has become to the point where it is no longer possible, even necessary, even to uh, argue the matter. Uh, you can publish a story about the Earth as it is in 1975, except that it isn't the Earth we know, but it's an Earth where, uh, where uh, the Spanish conquered England or where the Confederates won the Battle of Gettysburg. And everybody accepts it right off the bat. And I don't know how they proceed to rationalize it, but if you wanted to go through the lore of science, you can't find enough rationalizations to cover anything. <laughs> and so the, uh, what I call the Ukrainian novel, that is the novel of, the, of the, uh, an alternate presence, is perfectly acceptable. You can publish it without even an apology. Uh, Harry Harrison did it in the Transatlantic Tunnel. Uh, Michael Moorcock did it a couple of times. The Land of the Bioth, it is his most recent from Doubleday, uh, which uh, there are, you know, 1975 isn't the world we know. And this is acceptable. Now, this is fantasy, really, and yet it's, uh, it's a historical adventure, and it's, uh, it's not horror. But it shows that the, the, the lines of science fiction, which you can pass off as a science fiction novel, has become so blurred that almost anything can be provided as a marvelous adventure. And I think that is the key of what is going on. The question of the uh, economic market, which Bob Block brought up, is... Uh, quite tricky and quite difficult. It is true that paperback books in the fantastic categories have gone up to a dollar and a quarter, a dollar and a half, a dollar seventy-five, even two and a quarter. Uh, but it is also true that the number of copies printed has gone down because there is a, there is a certain public resistance to this. And uh, while it evens out, if you charge more and get back, uh, you know, sell less copies, you're still going to even out financially. As for the writer, to a certain extent, this will benefit him because his advance, which is based upon a percentage of the color price, will be higher. As uh, his royalties will be higher, maybe his advance may not be. Uh, though actually, in effect, they have gone up. The advance is paid by, let us say, uh, Ace Books in the days of the uh, blooming double books, which is actually uh, a thousand originally, and uh, sort of a half a royalty. Now, and then it went up in my time, toward the end of my time, at Ace, it was 12.50. Uh, uh, since there are no double books now, the average, the bottom advance would probably 1,500, the top advance could be anywhere, is 5,000, 6,000, which probably doesn't warrant uh, a top-notch writer from getting into it, but by and large, it isn't too bad. Uh, the problem, again, is distribution. Only a certain number of writers can command a very wide distribution. The rest have to be content with a pretty standardized type of sale. And that is the way it is. But as far as fantasy is concerned, I think that fantasy is getting more and more of a display and is getting more and more into the field as science fiction, as I said, blurs out. <coughs> For the benefit of those of you who were asleep while Mr. Wolheim was speaking, I believe he made an extremely interesting point about the blurring of lines between fantasy and science fiction. I'd like to extend that. As we all know, a number of books have become preeminently successful in hardcovers because they masqueraded as mainstream fiction. They were actually science fiction, but they were not presented as such. And uh, some of the practitioners in the field, such as Kurt Vonnegut Jr., steadfastly and publicly deny that they are writing science fiction. This seems to be accepted by the critics. But it occurred to me, in line with what Don was saying, that the distinctions between fantasy and mainstream are also blurring. Today's number one bestseller, uh, Dr. O's Ragtime, is certainly fantasy in that it blends historical events with fictional happenings 
in a rather curious fashion. And this book, again, as Don can attest, has just been sold for the highest advance, I believe, that has ever been paid for paperback republication. So there is perhaps an opportunity for others, if they can equal this quality of achievement, to really implement the fantasy field properly. And there is also today this renaissance and resurgence of interest in the strange, the curious, the supernatural. And we're all aware of happenings and circumstances in our very midst which cannot necessarily be accounted for. I know last night was Halloween, a time of strange transformations. I was <laughs> following a girl down the street and suddenly she turned into a drugstore. But that's the way it goes. <laughs> I wish we could keep this uh, discussion in a more dignified... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think the, this blurring thing is, uh, is, is good, Sensi. Um, I, I'm, I'm put in mind of uh, uh, somebody in, in the mystery field, a very successful uh, writer, John uh, Dixon Carr, who uh, very often will veer over into uh, fantastic stuff, and uh, uh, some, in a couple of his novels, he just is flat out fantastic, and the thing ends up as a ghost story, uh, no kidding around. I think, too, that uh, it, uh, it illustrates one, one point we should bear in mind, in that as we, we buy together here, we, we're, we're making this little army scene, uh, we should also be very careful not to do uh, what uh, the science fiction people uh, sometimes do tend to do, which is to draw a magical circle around themselves, which constricts. Uh, and Vonnegut uh, uh, wrote a, a fantastic, I don't know how many of you read it, a little piece on, the, uh, on science fiction and why he refused to be identified with the science fiction group. And he uh, said uh, very impolitely that uh, we thought that the science fiction people were reminded of somebody determined to stay in a public urinal, uh, refusing to budge, uh, no matter what. Uh, if we uh, insist on, on having a little label uh, that says, uh, I'm fantasy, pure and simple, and uh, you know, always consider me in this particular bag, <clears throat> and so on and so on, I think we're making a grievous mistake, indeed, and, and limiting the potential of the whole thing. Okay, now I guess the traditional uh, item is to throw it open to the, uh, the, uh, the rabble and uh, start ducking stones. Uh, anybody want to ask questions? And, and yes. Yeah, I'm afraid this is probably going to be harder, but maybe some Mr. Carter. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to communicate with them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I want to ask about is the, the recent paperback sale of Vonnegut's uh, Dark the reprint uh, Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith, where the people know what the figures are for those. I suppose you could uh, probably have a better guess at that than I have. Uh, I really don't know anything about that. Uh, is Judy Lynn in the audience? No, it's not. I can't think of any hands on that. I think Judy's with Lynn Carter. Uh, oh. If you want to know about that, ask me, because I'm asking Right. Yeah. Uh, if you want to know about fantasy sales, yes, if, they, if they're good read, not too quite, and ancient and so on, they sell damn well. The salesmen are asking for more and more and more of them. Here, here. Uh, there's a, a, a strong market for fantasy. Usually you want a good-sized book. Fantasy readers seem to uh, like a, a little more than the, the thin 60,000-word book, and for a darn good read, you can't develop a really good fantasy in that kind of way. Uh, most of them will be selling for $1.95 from now on, and uh, they'll be good-sized books. We just took on a book uh, of a quarter of a million work, about 600 pages, but God knows what that'll cost, and two and a quarter, I suppose. Uh, I think it's the best thing from Tolkien. I'm not saying it is Tolkien, it's the best thing since. Uh, we expect uh, to sell a lot of that, uh, hardcover first. <laughs> <laughs> I want to grow sales figures. If you not have any You're not idea. going to get them because that's none of your business, not company business. Why? Why? Why, why is it a secret? Uh, why should we give that up? Uh, give me your gross income for last year. Uh, I've been unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with that, uh, 
that relationship. The, the, uh, um, uh, the magazine I mean, belongs to a thing called the Cartoonist Guild, which makes all kinds of desperate efforts to uh, increase the, the living standard of cartoonists. And um, they came up with a incisive uh, observation, which <clears throat> what they did was they compared the uh, amount of money that the um, cartoonist got for an individual cartoon uh, with the uh, increase in the subscription uh, rates and the advertising uh, income. And there was a, a fascinating uh, divergence always. I mean, the uh, magazine's income would go like this, and the cartoonist's income would sort of kind of maybe go like that. You know? That is that is a fact, and, and, and I don't uh, have any knowledge as far as the uh, book publishing thing is concerned. I don't think there's a parallel. The writers, be... I think, are making more money now, though. So what's that? The writers are making more money. I think that's a fair it's statement, true. yeah. The expenses have gone up considerably, and much more important than that, as Don indicated, the royalties have gone up because books cost more. You used to get uh, a little over a penny for a paper package on sale if you were a writer. Now it runs around nine cents and up. And that's more than the cost of living increase. Yeah. Yes. Is it true, though, that the market for children's fantasy, or it ranks specifically the children's market, is much, is much higher than running for what you call the adult market or the regular paperback trade or whatever? I, yeah, I find uh, I'll pass the, I've gotten into the uh, the children's books thing for just that very reason uh, that uh, if you uh, can write a, a tolerable uh, children's book, it's almost always a fantasy. At least uh, there are some, you know, uh, Dick and Jane go out into the country and learn how to chop logs. But um, <laughs> usually it's uh, it's, a, it's some kind of a wig out into some dream and. Uh, <coughs> I have found it's remarkably to sell them, and that they're anxious for more, and that they're very cooperative. Uh, uh, it's so yeah. Anybody care about somewhere? I think there's quite a, a, a rise in the amount of fantasy being published in children's books these days. Looking through publishers' catalogs, I see almost a, like a 40 percent sometimes of books that you can classify as either quasi science fiction or outright pure fantasy. I have noted that there's been a great increase in juvenile fantasy being written, but not all of it intentionally. <laughs> well, to get back to the young man who was unemployed, uh, and also Lester, I think that perhaps maybe not too many people in this room are aware of the fact that in the paperback business, you could, what they do when they don't sell a book is they tear off the cover and they send it back to the manufacturer. And they can do this any time at all. There's an, un, up, there's an open ended policy on it. And that's why it's a little difficult to figure income for authors. I, I, can you imagine a, somebody tearing off a sleeve of a dress and returning it to a manufacturer for the full price? I mean, this is a. a an, an unbelievable system that they have, but apparently the wholesalers are run by mafia or their relatives, and there's no way of breaking it. And that's... Yeah, it does, it does say it's sort of a, kind of a, a Freudian giveaway as to their basic attitude to their stock, I think. So they can't wait to tear the things apart. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I know that people like Harlan Ellison specifically in the science fiction field, and I, I don't want to get into that because I know it's fantasy. Good. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, has deplored the fact that uh, science fiction, this tending to blur that you've noted, uh, getting into mainstream uh, would ruin the integrity of the field itself. Do you feel that this uh, would happen in fantasy also? I realize that the sales might go up if you could if the uh, borders tended to blur between, between strict fantasy and mainstream fiction? Do you feel it would ruin the integrity of the field? No, I think that uh, the classics uh, in the field have uh, very... Sometimes they come from what you might call the field, but uh, very often they come from uh, uh, no field at all. I mean, the Bram Stoker uh, was a, uh, a showbiz uh, uh, agent, and uh, when they, he wrote Dracula, and uh, uh, Mary Shelley was, uh, you know, had a bad dream and so on. So <laughs> I think that the, the fantasy is, is, is just, it's a viable thing. 
And the, the, the Vonnegut premise is correct, that uh, if you uh, mistake being this label for doing something that's valid, uh, you're making, you're, you're just, you're taking this, the Zanasto say, the pointing finger for the moon. So if they see on the back spine it says Gothic, or it says Western, or it says science fiction, okay, they know where to put it. If it doesn't say anything, they don't know where to put it. And then you send it back, and I stick it in a lot of mainstream stuff, which may have no relationship to what the, the reader, the would-be reader, is looking for. So the, there's a sort of compulsory classification that it does continue, uh, at least in the payback field, and it's frankly a vital thing for payback publishers to do this. By the way, I think that some, they really, there were some of these uh, banking you know, things they should, instead of writing Gothic or something, they should work out little symbols you know, for the illiterate ones. So. <laughs> I have a horror story in that connection. <laughs> I wrote a mystery novel two years ago, which is horrible enough in itself, but I made the mistake of titling it American Gothic. <laughs> in paperback, I have seen this not ever on the mystery shelf either in the Gothic section or under American history. <laughs> I, I wonder if any of you would uh, comment on the significance of uh, the emergence of non-newsstand paying Spanish markets, you know, in Whisper. I'm kind of sick of them now that they have penny or worse. Do you think this will have, have any significant effect on things? I, I do. I think that uh, uh, efforts like Whispers are uh, extremely uh, healthy and uh, um, Yes, I think they're excellent. Uh, you're sort of pumping energy into the, uh, into the field. And uh, as Mr. Block was saying, it's a, uh, a market where you know what's, uh, what's being bought uh, so that you can write that sort of stuff for that sort of a market. I think they're marvelous. I, I wish God's faith to anybody gets into that. It's a great and necessary encouragement for young writers, and I, I'm all for it. I think that, that indicates that there is a demand for the short story, which is not being supplied by professional publication. Uh, and the best horror stories of the year and the best fantasy stories of the year are uh, being driven to draw on sources like that because there just aren't enough uh, good fantasy or horror short stories available in professional publications. So this is, this is a very excellent development. I've just been told that the gentleman over in the corner there has been trying to get uh, my eye and he's failed. Uh, is there a question to that? I don't know, somebody over, Mr. Black, there's somebody over here. There must have been an illusion or something, I think. Yeah. Two brief questions. Mr. Wolhan had success publishing the uh, horror stories, which was originally a British publication. Uh, both Fontana and Penn put out a uh, series of horror stories. Uh, which you can get mail order through Britain or up in Canada if you happen to be buying books there. But I've never seen any of those on the American market. Wondered why uh, they weren't republished uh, in this country. And also what the, uh, what the possibility would be of republishing some of the uh, out-of-print pulps. Uh, we had that in sh with, with some of the shadows and uh, Doc Savage, etc. Why not some of the short stories that appeared in Weird Tales uh, or even issues of Weird Tales uh, reprinted as paperbacks. Well, that's it's a possibility. The, uh, I know that in England, the uh, book of collected ghost or horror stories, such as you mentioned the Pan Collection and others, have apparently had a steady and loyal audience. Uh, this has evidently not been the case in the United States. Uh, perhaps there's a market which uh, I will say my competitors are overlooked. Uh, I found my more or less accident. Uh, it exists. There is a market here for that. Why didn't anybody in paperback pick up the parent book for American editions? Uh, the answer to that is that I don't know. Uh, I think the, thinking back on my own experience as an editor, I would say that an editor who comes up with this idea has got to persuade the publisher. The publishers of paperback companies are not usually book people. They are accountants. They are hired executives. They will look at the book and say, well, why, if this is so good, do uh, that none of our competitors published it. And they tend to draw back. Why do we do this? Look, we can put out a Gothic novel or a Western for the same price and be sure that it will sell. We don't know that this will sell. And these men are, they are working in dollars and cents and hard facts, and uh, they, they draw back. They draw back from experiments of that sort. 
they have to. Uh, the gentleman who asked, uh, why has anyone in this country published the, uh, either the Pan or the Big Old Collections of Horror Stories? Well, a few years back, uh, Berkeley published about three of the uh, Pan Horror Stories, and the uh, Big Old Book, which is a uh, subsidiary of Valentine, I think, has been uh, doing uh, the uh, Montana series for about five years now. So they also been doing Robert Aikman's uh, series of uh, the best ghost stories as well. So they have been reprinted in this country. I was, uh, so about two years ago, I was finding on the newsstands all the time. But I, I don't think that uh, Bigel was, uh, or Berkeley has been reprinting them since then. I think that uh, that and the occult uh, explosion, as they call it, is uh, usually this is the fascination with the uh, uh, devils and uh, uh, strange wonders and uh, eerie powers and so on coincides with the uh, societal collapse. Uh, the uh, I mean, Rasputin and uh, uh, Cagliostro and uh, Saint-Germain, all, the, all those biggies, uh, even uh, uh, Crowley, uh, tied in very much with a, a whole social order falling apart, and certainly we're in the presence of a whole social order falling apart. Uh, a lack of um, ability to believe, and I think the Gallup poll just got through a, a, a depressing survey, and they found out that the general American public's uh, get up and goism is. Uh, at the lowest that it's ever been since they started. The New York Times had a uh, survey, and the same kind of a thing developed. So it's, uh, <clears throat> it's very, people are looking around for the devil. I mean, and they want, they want to uh, get him and get him good. So I, I think probably that's one good reason why the Exorcist and, and, uh, and the Rosemary's Baby and so on is, is going on. I think also uh, they were uh, mocking good entertainment. And uh, I think people just love to be scared, really. So there's that. There's a more mundane explanation. The books that were mentioned had tremendous exploitation. I don't think that at this late date it does any harm to reveal what was very well known in Hollywood at the time, that when Paramount bought uh, Rosemary's Baby from Phil Castle, who had it auction, they sent, uh, set aside a certain sum of money. They sent it to all of their exchanges, all of their film exchanges in the major American cities, and had the employees go out and buy X number of copies of this book in hard covers, which automatically made it a bestseller, which automatically brought it to the attention of paperback houses as an important work. And this is not new, nor is this a put down of Paramount's procedures, because this is precisely on a smaller scale what a certain writer named Jack London used to do about the turn of the century. He, he had been a, a, a hobo and an itinerant, and he happened to have friends in many, many cities. Whenever he was about to publish a book, he would send money to these friends to say, go to your bookstore and buy two copies. And lo and behold, he became a bestseller. <laughs> I only mention this sort of thing because I know Harlan isn't in the room and won't uh, try. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, uh, remember listening to a publisher, Shelby Nayless, telling me that they had uh, somehow or other figured out which of the bookstores uh, the New York Times go to to clear out their uh, New York Times bestseller list, and uh, they besieged them and bought this this uh, sort of bummer book, and they got it on. They weren't. So. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Hands, hands. Yes. For Mr. Wolheim, are you going to are you going to be publishing uh, more horror fantasy in the future for the Zod books? Uh, more what kind of fantasy? Horror fantasy, uh, weird stories. Re old, I uh, mean reprints? Uh, both old and new. Like, I think that you currently have an anthology that Paul Bergman has sort of uh, modern the two of in those stories. Yeah, well, those are all new stories written to order. Uh, that's The Disciples of Cthulhu, which Paul Bergman uh, and Edward Bergman put together. Which we'll be doing sometime in the middle of next year. But they're all original stories written on the Cthulhu theme. Uh, there's, no, there's no reprints there. Uh, I think uh, somebody mentioned the idea of uh, 
putting out a book of reprints of great classic short stories and novelists from weird tales and things of that sort. It's an interesting experiment. Uh, I personally don't tend to try it, but somebody might. Would you possibly try issuing uh, collections of short stories by, say, Robert Aikman or uh, David Drake or maybe two uh, well-known Well, the problem, the, the problem, of course, is the question of the names of people. Uh, uh, you are up against a, a vast ignorance on the part of your, your wholesaler, your distributor, and unless they, they know about a dozen names in the fantasy field, and if you got somebody that they never heard of, or the specialist never heard of, you're, you're in real trouble. You're not going to move that far. And this is true, unfortunately, of Robert Aikman, whose name is really quite unknown here. And uh, so it becomes too much of a risk to produce it. Uh, we saw this fellow over there, by the way, he's recording and he's holding a microphone up. <laughs> yes. Um, I read that uh, um, Ocean Pictures published an uh, Ocean Pictures studio will we'll put out about oh, 10 movies. Three or four may be hits, and the other six may be failures. What is the ratio of hits and failures that are published now as much as you buy in the process? I really don't think of it in that terms. Um, the problem is the percentage of sale of a book uh, hits the stand. As my wife said before, they have the obnoxious habit of ripping covers off and sending the covers back for full credit. Payback books go out on a full return basis, except, you know, the, the, to save the cost of shipping the book back from a country which is 3,000 miles wide, they ship the cover back. And I give them full credit on that, and they sign an affidavit that they have shredded the rest of the book which gives me a little bit of an instant. If anybody here should happen to find paperback books without covers being sold, this is an illegal and criminal operation, and to please report it to the publishers involved, because they act continuously to break this kind of racket up. They are ripping off not only the publisher, but also the authors. Uh, the question then is, what is the percentage of sale of a book? Uh, with an average title, not a bestseller, but an average good title, let us say, by a good writer and a good novel, uh, you may still, with luck, get 60% sale, because you're going to get a certain percentage of covers torn up that never, ever got on the newsstand at all. Now, a lot of these boxes are shipped into a wholesaler or shipped out to a retailer, and he will say, well, I got no have no space in my room, and I never heard of this author, and we've got five, 15 bestsellers moving fast, don't even open the boxes. Ship them back, and they'll ship them back, and they'll rip the covers off. The books will never appear, and you get a percentage like that. Uh, there was a breakdown in Publishers Weekly of the average sales of the big, of the major five major paperback houses. I think Bantam was the biggest paperback house in the business, occupying something like 16 or 17 percent of the market. And uh, they had an excellent uh, uh, average distribution. They got 65% of their books out, so, which means that they still got like 25 or 35 percent covers torn off. Uh, the company that distributes me with the Boomer co publishers New American Library has a running average of 50%, uh, which means that some of their worst books probably sell 30%, some of their best books sell 80%, and it works out that way. But uh, it's, it is a very rough and competitive and ugly and chaotic scene. Uh, my wife before said mafia. Well, that's not fair. It isn't mafia, but these are distributors who built and fought and kicked their way up by newsstand distribution, and they still have a pretty hard-boiled attitude towards it. Another problem is that uh, bookshops have only so many slots to put books in. And the books are being produced per month perhaps three times more than the actual slots that a bookstore has. So the life of a book, yeah, you know, when it does get on sale, it may not be more than sometimes three days and sometimes two weeks, but a little more than that. Uh, perhaps the saving grace is the growing uh, creation of specialist science fiction fantasy bookshops in this country, where science fiction will have a, a lifetime sale of years even. They'll keep it going as long as people are interested in buying it. But this is unique. This is very special. The average paperback book, if it's not a bestseller, is lucky if it's around for a week and a half. I, I think that's a, a very good point. The, uh, <coughs> if, uh, 
for those who are uh, effective uh, organizers and workers in this group, uh, that uh, the, the specialist uh, bookshop is a heck of a good idea. If we could somehow or other get, get them located in, in the major cities, you could really revolutionize the, uh, this business dramatically. Yeah. How many of those bookstores are there? Are there well, there's one in New York, uh, and there's uh, uh, one, in one in Cambridge, one in Los Angeles, one in Boston, one in Boston. Boulder, is there one in Boulder? Yeah. One in Boulder. Philadelphia. Uh, so, well, I guess about 12 or 15. Well, let's make it 30. Uh -huh. Another figure, Dan? Dan. Aren't you know, the rise of these um, specialized paperback houses, paperback stores also perform the same kind of function like paperback stores when they're huge, you know? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, they are. Yes. Well, I think that the science fiction uh, books do stay on the stands a little bit longer because most bookstores now have a science fiction section. And I, I, I really believe that they do stay on longer. Well, I think the point was made back there by the, uh, the uh, uh, don't be afraid of the label as a, as a commercial uh, way of, you put it into this, this, this box and this bin and it says science fiction and even gothic and whatnot, mystery. And they do, they do stay there. <laughs> so that's, that's true, that's good. It's a weapon, it's a good weapon. Yeah. As an artist, I say that uh, <laughs> I would overestimate the whole thing, so I'll pass down to a couple. Uh, what was this question again? Oh, the influence of the art. Well, I think that essentially a paperback book has only one ad going for it, and that's its own cover. Uh, paperback readers as a whole don't read book review sections, and they don't read book review magazines. Uh, all they see in the book is when they see it on the stand. So what that book has to sell it is its cover. Its cover is a poster. And the copy in the back, if you can get them, take the damn thing off the rack and look at the back cover, is the rest of the sales uh, pitch. And that's it. That's all it's got going for it. I think that in many instances when I have uh, fallen among thieves and listened to the conversation of editors and publishers, that about 70% of their shop talk is devoted to covers and cover artists. And as Gayan Wilson, the poor man's Richard Upton Pickman, just, uh, <laughs> modestly disclaimed that uh, he, he might overestimate the influence of, of covers, but along with uh, Mr. Wolham, I would say that this is probably the most important single factor, plus the label. And I have been agitating for years to get the labels on my books changed to porno so that the aesthetic <laughs> sense. And yet, to that, I thank God when something appears with a, a good, strong cover. <laughs> Well, I think he's too intelligent, cultured gentleman. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, yes. back to the strictly marketing proposition. The answer is that the kind of book you mentioned, which is half, let's say, juvenile fantasy, half adult fantasy, or half science fiction, 
is the publisher's horror because he doesn't know what to label it, he doesn't know where to put it, he doesn't know how to reach the public who's going to buy it. And uh, this is uh, sort of thing that keeps publishers from actually making that sort of experiment because it, it's, a, it's a marketing uh, fright. They don't, they don't know what to do with it. Oh, a young adult science fantasy. Young adult science fantasy, yeah. <laughs> Oh, like it's sort of ex uh, yeah. Uh, it seems to me that it's like in it, the actual industry is dictating the public's taste matters by uh, not having a concerted program of, uh, you know, it seems like the money is uh, totally <coughs> evaluating the quality of the literature. Like Tolkien came out and it kind of just blew things all out of proportion. And this recent Valentine research was just like a, like you say, it's an offshoot in the... Uh, result of the Tolkien thing in, in a superficial sense, but would there be any hope for like concerted effort to get things together instead of just, it seems like it's going to end pretty soon. It's going to end pretty soon. Well, I mean, uh, it just seems like uh, no more classics are coming out. Well, I don't think, I think one of the, uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> what's happened in the publishing thing generally for sure is that the, uh, as uh, Wilhelm says, the money people are in charge. And uh, I mean, you know, the uh, Quaker Oats people own the <coughs> publishing houses, and it's just, it's, it's another commodity. And uh, they never read the darn books, they just look at statistics, and uh, it becomes, uh, yeah, so it's a sure, sure calculation, uh, uh, having nothing to do with the writing. And as far as the uh, trying, so, so they're the organizers. I mean, they're, they they feel they've got to take to organize, and the joke, of course, is they don't, because the classics uh, always come out of left field, usually. And there's some weirdo who's got this fantastic idea in a song, and he comes and he does it. So, and, and so they can't predict that, and all of a sudden they find, there it is, you know. So, so then they get a bandwagon, and they try to make that another part of the calculation. So it's really kind of ridiculous. And phony. Actually, there's nothing all that unique about a few people dictating the taste of the public. When you come right down to it, in actuality, three men control the output for 220 million people in our television networks. The three heads are the final arbiters of what goes on, and the few people, the executives under them, to whom authority has been delegated as their representatives to tell you what you will or will not see on the tube every day of your life. In motion pictures, a very few producers today in the, at a time of independent production dictate what appears on the screen by virtue of one thing. They've been able to get up the money to produce a film, and they can produce exactly what they want. And while they may rely on some kind of uh, hunch or superficial marketing examination, nevertheless, it is their taste or lack of taste which determines what you're going to see. As far as books and paperbacks are concerned, I believe that fantasy is a late bloomer and uh, the growth popularity is always a slow phenomenon. There are very few overnight successes unless they are merchandised in a major market as such. But even Tolkien took several years really to catch on the college campuses. I think the college campuses is where, where it's at today for fantasy and science fiction. In my uh, prehistoric memories of childhood, I recall that I discovered fantasy in the only place that you could discover it in those days, a public library. I soon learned, when I got into those adult stacks, I think it was about seven years old, I began to meet other youngsters who were into it. There was no special uh, attempt to label, categorize fantasy for children as opposed to fantasy for adults, but after I'd read it was in the children's section, I naturally got into the adult stacks, and I made discoveries on my own. And I think all of us are more or less pioneers. Each, each of you have had your own special kind of introduction to fantasy, and I think that once you were hooked, if you were hooked, you began to seek it out wherever you could. You, you went to these second-hand bookstores in many cases, I think, to find it, and you've been uh, patronizing the dealers that uh, offer this material. But it, the big problem, as Don pointed out, is that the life expectancy of the average paperback is so short, and the life expectancy of the average novel is equally short. The juveniles are constantly recredited because the, the publishers realize that there is a new and growing, literally growing audience for them, which uh, is renewed every year or so. 
but it is a very, very difficult thing for a fantasy to establish classical status in a short period of time. Uh, <clears throat> I, I thought up my Oyster Rolex cost more to repair than I, uh, I spent for it in the first place, so I haven't got an idea what the time is. Are we, are, where are we as far as the... Uh, so are we at the uh, sort of the time with the closest? Uh, okay. So is there any, any last flurry of? Uh, yeah. I have a lot of comments about taxes being in college that go by without comment, and that we didn't high school yet, and what the And then I also must say with great pride that Don is his own man and nobody dictates the policy of door books. And that's the way NAL said it. They said, any way you want to come, come. That's a good way, Paris. Okay, <laughs> okay well, uh, thank you very much. Sir.